Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Here. Mayor Benjamin. Here. Thank you. Uh, if everyone would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation. Let us pray. Creator God, for the beauty of this day and for all that you've done for us, for the ability to gather, discuss, and make decisions on the vital issues of our city. Lord, we simply ask that you might touch and invigorate us with your presence and with your power. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Uh, Madam Clerk and Mr. Acting uh, Assistant, Acting City Manager, um, on the agenda, I want to add a proclamation of seek awareness and appreciation, um, and uh, plug them in uh, right before we hear from the beautiful Miss Toomer. All right, so um, in front of the presentations. All right. All right. Do we have a motion? I'm sorry. Is there any input on the agenda? Is there a motion? So move. Uh, to approve the agenda. Is second. it a second? Any right, discussion? With the previous question, Clerk Carl Rowe. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. All right. Has any input? All right. Uh, is there a motion on the uh, minutes of March 6, 2018? Move approval of the March 6 minutes. Is there, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. The clerk call the roll. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Great, thank you. All right. Um, consent agenda. Items 9 through 30. Any items of concern or um, clarification needed? Mr. Rickerman. We have on there the bond, uh, is that, I had it marked, I was trying to locate a, a document I had. Are you looking for the stormwater or water and sewer bond? Yeah. Those are later on, those are like items 45, 46, 47. Okay. I just want to make sure that we talk about what we're doing with that, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that people understand the projects and the priorities and, and how. And maybe even an update on, on the, some of the projects that are underway or are coming down. Some of the ones you covered earlier would be helpful as well. When we get there, when we get there. All right. And then I did want to note item 24 that, that folks, I know a lot of people have been looking at as we continue to work on Rocky Branch. That they know we're continuing to improve the. Get your microphone, Daniel. The system isn't not working. Right. There we go. All right. All right. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move we can approve the consent agenda items 9 through 30. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. I had the wonderful opportunity uh, <clears throat> this past weekend uh, to visit a beautiful Sikh temple in, um, just outside Chapin, uh, South Carolina. I was, I was invited uh, for uh, uh, a holy day celebration of Vasakai? Vasaki, Vasaki, I was close. Uh, Vasaki, uh, recognizing the founding of the Sikh order in, in, in 1699, uh, the beginning of it. And it was a, uh, a humbling uh, cultural experience. Uh, if I must say, some really good eating, some good food, and uh, had an opportunity to recognize a large and growing uh, Sikh community uh, here in the in the Midlands, I think upwards of 400 families now, and uh, and um, hopefully over the next uh, year and years, uh, we'll start spending a whole lot more time educating people on on, on Sikhism and the wonderful things that um, our, our our growing Indian community uh, has been doing here in in the Midlands. Dr. Singh, I'm not sure if you wanted to say something uh, briefly, but if, if it, please.
good afternoon everyone good afternoon uh first of all i would like to say thank you to respected mayor benjamin who accepted uh, our invitation and was a part of our congregation on sunday just a basic thing which i would like to share with all the members here that because of uh, identity crisis if you notice uh, some of my community members are wearing turban so many attacks happen in united states during last 6 uh, 7 years where people are educated where people know about sikh community there is no problem like metropolitan cities but the communities especially in south so many people are not aware about that was what my main purpose to uh invite him so that we can share so many values which are like the other people around the world we love peace we love all other communities that was the message which we share in our community on sunday uh 1699 that's when we are uh in india state of punjab 10th guru guru gobind singh baptized people for equality he mentioned that there will be no color there will be no caste there will be no creed all humans are created equal that was the message behind that baptism ceremony in 1699 i'm so proud to be here a uh, member of this uh, city council today with my community members again uh, it's a kind of a new year for the sikh community wish all of you guys as well as this state this uh, uh, city this nation god bless america thank, thank you so much mr mayor and god and god bless you uh dr singh uh the commitment um of seeks to humanity to religious tolerance religious freedom is consistent with the very best values of this of this country and this uh city uh was also founded on those principles and and hopefully we'll continue to move towards being a more perfect union and perfect uh, city. Uh it is um a pleasure on behalf of the uh, city of, of Columbia to name this month Sikh Awareness and Appreciation Month and if you wouldn't mind I'd love to uh, present you with this certificate. Mr. Acting City Manager. Next item on the agenda, item 31 is recognition of Delaney Toomer as Miss Richland County Teen, Mayor Stephen K. Benjamin. She's beautiful and she's smart and she's talented and she is our Miss Richland County Teen. Uh Delaney, I think you brought some other people with you today as well, but would you have take a moment and and address us, please? Come on. Be sure to recognize your mama too. <laughs> okay, so good evening everyone. My name is Delaney Toomer and I'm Miss Richland County Teen 2018 and I have my sweet helpful mother. She's my momager right now since we've gotten into <laughs> this pageant world. We're learning together, but it's really an honor to represent Richland County as I go on my journey to Miss South Carolina Teen. I've lived in Richland County ever since I was 8 years old. I've grown up in the school system and I'm really really excited to get to work and to continue to gather in the community. Um the Miss South Carolina organization, I'm actually in the Miss America's Outstanding Teen organization which is the national organization for the Miss South Carolina Teen organization. 
and it's the largest scholarship provider for women in the entire country. So it's truly amazing to be part of an organization that's so dedicated to community service. And my personal platform that I've decided to advocate throughout the rest of my reign is called All Rise, and it's called an SOS call to parents from students. And my goal is to get parents of children in grades pre k through third to commit to their child by showing up in the classroom, showing up in the school, multiple times per year because I really think that that will excite students about learning. I know that that age are, is the critical age to get that foundation set so that the students can be successful, successful for high school and beyond. And I'm excited to continue my initiative with my pledge card and continue to keep speaking to parent teacher organizations, rotary clubs around Richland County to get parents to commit to visiting their child. and. I can't wait to see where this goes. Thank you all for your support, and I'm happy to be here. By the way. You guys also realize that it gets a little late in the day. We've been here since uh, early afternoon. We get a little punchy too, okay? So y'all bear with us, bear with us. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Acting City Manager. We talked about it. Item number 32, Power Talk 21 Day Proclamation, the Honorable Mayor Stephen K. Benjamin. All right. The, um, Power Talk. Um, whereas the city of Columbia recognize the importance of parents talking with their teens about alcohol in order to reduce the risk of dangers posed to teens and communities, and whereas high school students who use alcohol and other substances are five times more likely to drop out of school or believe, or believe making good grades is not important, and whereas 27% of middle school students try alcohol before graduating from the eighth grade, significantly increasing the risk that they will develop alcohol problems later in life. And whereas teen alcohol use kills 4,300 people each year, more than all other legal drugs combined. And whereas the majority of kids say their parents are the pri their primary influence when it comes to decisions about drinking alcohol. And whereas Power Talk 21 Day, started by Mothers Against Drunk Driving in 2011, was established to encourage parents and caregivers to embrace their important role in influencing America's youth and their decisions about drinking alcohol. And whereas in 2018, MAD encouraged parents to use Power Talk 21 on April 21st uh, as part of the Power of Parents program to create a national and prolonged conversation about underage drinking among middle school and high school students. And whereas to equip parents uh, to talk with their teens about alcohol, Mads Columbia affiliate will give parents the tools to effectively talk to their children about alcohol to protect them. And whereas the city of Columbia recognizes the importance of talking to youth about alcohol consumption and abuse uh, to reduce their risk and dangers posed to teens and communities, now therefore I, Stephen K. Benjamin, Mayor of the City of Columbia, along with my fellow members of the City Council, do hereby proclaim um, April 21st, 2018 to be Power Talk 21 Day.
in the city of Columbia, and we um, urge our fellow citizens to recognize and participate in its observance. Who's here to receive this on behalf of MAD? Please. Would you like to say something? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Benjamin and all the council members. Uh, on April 21st, we just want to encourage parents to begin having this conversation about alcohol with your young people. We know that parents are the biggest influencer when it comes to their decisions and their mindset on alcohol. And we know by providing this information to parents now, they're able to change their students' perspectives and they're able to make the right decisions regarding alcohol. So thank you. Amen. Item 33, Columbia Fair Housing Month and National Community Development Week Proclamation. Ms. Gloria Saeed, Director of Community Development. Good evening. Hey, Gloria. Mayor Benjamin, members hey. of City Council. Hey. Acting Director Taylor. I'm excited to be here this evening to tell you all about the many activities that we are engaged in during the month of April. During April, the City of Columbia Community Development Department recognizes National Community Development Week, Fair Housing Month, as well as Financial Literacy Month. The City of Columbia receives an entitlement award from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for Community Development Block Grant, known as CDBG, and Home Investment Partnership Funding. These funds are used to improve the physical, economic, and social conditions and to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing in our community. This year, we held our CD Week press conference kickoff on April 2nd at the Columbia Arts Center, located at 1227 Taylor Street. I'd like to thank Councilman Duvall and Councilman Davis, as well as Dalton Tresvant with Congressman Clyburn's office for attending our press conference. The Art Center was selected at, as the venue to highlight the CDBG funding used to upfit the building, totaling $456,644. In addition to that, the City of Columbia contributed $392,056 as leveraging. The City of Columbia during the past year, the community development awarded the Columbia Housing Authority $579,150 in home funds to construct five of the 12 new houses in the Lion Street community. Those units were constructed for home ownership, and we are excited about the fact that we also use home funding and CDBG dollars to provide mortgages to those families who are at 80% or below the area AMI. Other, <clears throat> excuse me. Other activities held during CD Week included a two-part series, home buyer workshop at the Richland County Library on St. Andrews Road. We had 40 participants in attendance. And lastly, we ended the week with a CDBG community development block party which was a lot of fun. Um, this is our second year uh, holding the block party and it was such a hit last year, we decided to do it again. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the city departments that assisted us, such as the City of Columbia Police Department and Parks and Recreation, and those departments who set up vendor tables. We had code enforcement as well as business license uh, and our own community development staff who were there to talk to the public about the services that our departments provide. We had great attendance from uh, the public 
who were walking by. They heard the loud music and it sort of just drew, you know, drew them in. We served them hot dogs and hamburgers and chips. And um, we had a great time just uh, uh, socializing and, and talking about the great things that the city has to offer. We also had quite a few more city employees attend this year, which was very exciting as well. Of course, by now you've heard that, <clears throat> you are aware that the Congress funded CDBG uh, entitlement program, $3.3 billion, and that's an increase from the prior year. It's an increase of $300 million. And they also funded home, the home entitlement program, $1.362 billion, which is an increase of $412 million from last year. So we can expect to receive some additional funds for CDBG and home as well in the coming year. You have in your folder <clears throat> a list of other activities that we have planned for the month of April. That includes a financial literacy workshop, a public hearing for our fiscal year 2018-2019 action plan, another one of our speak out series that we hold on a quarterly basis and this topic for the meeting um, that we'll hold uh, this week is concentration of racial ethnic segregation and disability discrimination uh, so these these speak out sessions are important because this is when we get to hear back from the public and it helps us when we're uh, designing our programs in terms of meeting those needs of the, of the citizens um, to highlight, in addition to highlight the 50th anniversary of, fair, of the Fair Housing Act, the City of Columbia has partnered with Richland County, Lexington County, the South Carolina Human Affairs Commission, Appleseed Legal Justice, School Districts 1 and 2, and other organizations to plan a two-day CRISM event. And CRISM stands for Civil Rights, It Still Matters. This event is scheduled for April 27th and 28th, and the focus is poverty, community and language access, a problem-solving exercise. And Councilwoman Devine, this exercise will actually be a poverty simulation. And I remember that you and I talked about that when we were in Atlanta, uh, that it would be a good opportunity if Council, if you're able to attend, uh, to be a part of that. Our staff uh, participated in a poverty simulation last year, and it was very eye-opening. Um, it's a way to understand what families go through who may not have access to transportation, uh, who may be homeless, uh, who might be faced with other uh, issues regarding disabilities, um, just a myriad of things where it's very easy for us to have access to things we basically trade places and, and, and do a simulation as though we, we have nothing. And um, it's a great way to understand who it is that we're serving. Um, so hopefully you can join us. There's information. You should have received an, um, uh, an invitation already by email, but we do have information in the folder uh, for you as well as our calendar. In addition to that, we have our annual report uh, fresh off the press. Uh, that you all can use as you are traveling across the country uh, to share with other uh, uh, municipalities about our funding and the various programs and uh, the services that we're providing uh, on an annual basis. So I've got some exciting news for you and you. Um, wait a minute. Well, for I mean, all of you. Come on okay, now. I mean, you. you went, you graduated from kindergarten, right? Yeah, if well, you don't have something for everybody, I'm you can. About, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about kindergar kindergartners in just a second. Uh, but I'll, I'll wrap all this up so they'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so please um, join us if you can on the, 20, on the 27th. So um, all, you also know that we have a, a bank on. Columbia Fresh Start program that we run through uh, community development, uh, our Change Up Columbia, and also our individual development accounts are offered as a part of our financial empowerment programs. I'm excited to announce that community development plans to launch two new pilot programs this year. Beginning next month, we will offer an employee financial wellness program. And the purpose of this program is to empower our city employees by offering budgeting, 
and credit building financial workshops. This voluntary program will be offered to public works and wastewater employees during work hours. We're starting with those two departments as a pilot so that we can tweak it. Because You know I'm all about tweaking. <laughs> Before we expand it, we want to make sure that we're identifying any things that we might need to improve on. Um, but we will uh, launch that program in May. And the goal is to help employees reduce financial stress, practice good financial behaviors, and achieve overall financial well-being, regardless of the salary they earn. Uh, <clears throat> wonderful. That's wonderful. As, as well as offering these, these workshops, the city has partnered with Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to offer free, private, one-on-one -on -one budgeting and credit coaching through either teleconference or video conference. This partnership was a result of Councilwoman Devine and me attending a National League of Cities Financial Inclusion Summit in Atlanta last year. So, we're excited about that. In addition, our Child Savings Account Program, CSA, will be launched in the fall. The pilot program will be offered to Watkins Nance Elementary School kindergartners. The intent of the program is to teach children early in life the importance of savings. Ideally, the goal will be for them to maintain their accounts and upon graduation, use the funds to support other educational pursuits. We have raised $15,000 in corporate donations from three banking institutions. They include First Citizens Bank, Security Federal, and South State Bank. Each donated and or committed $5,000. So that should be enough for us to. That should be enough for us to administer these programs for at least two years. Uh, we're very um, excited about this and look forward to the success of the program so that we can continue to uh, look for other fundraising opportunities to support continuing the program. Thank you, Gloria. So. Now, Mayor Benjamin, if you would present the CD Week no, we are, Fair uh, Housing Proclamation. We are, we are proud. And then afterwards, yeah. I'd like to ask our staff to come up and take a picture with Council. Oh, absolutely. Well. No, we're, we're proud and, and excited about all these new efforts and the consistent work. Uh, as some of you may have caught, um, contrary to um, we try to be as nonpartisan and bipartisan as possible. The reality is that the president's budget proposal did not call for increases in home or community development dollars and everything else. But the Republican Congress, working with the Democrats, uh, did you, in fact. You would be yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, Representative Frillinghausen and, and others really stepped up and, and made sure that we could all continue to be cities for all people, uh, communities for all people. And uh, these significant increases uh, in CDBG and home and other programs are going to inure to the benefit of families uh, everywhere. Uh, these these micro-targeted programs that you mentioned, um, speaking to our families and our children, uh, I believe will, will pay dividends for many years to come. It, we're, so we're happy uh, to recognize um, April 2018 as Columbia Fair Housing Month, and also the first week of this month, um, in, um, uh, in retrospect, is National Community Development Week. I want to encourage you and your team to continue doing the good work that you're doing. All right, we've got some good stuff on the, on the agenda a little later on, too, so we'll talk about that when it comes up. All right? Okay. Thank you.
Ms. Saeed? Yes, sir. All right. So at this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Faith Moss. Ms. Moss is an IDA participant, an individual development account participant, and I'd like to ask her to come forward and make a few comments in uh, reference to in, uh, our financial literacy proclamation. Hey there. Hi, good evening, how are y'all? My name is Faith Moss and I'm a student at USC. My major is currently retail management and I plan to embark on a career in retail law after and attend law school. I just wanted to speak a little bit about my experience with the IDA program so far. Um, my mother reached, found out about it from one of her friends and from there we reached out to Ms. Charmaine Clark who helped me get enrolled and get me on the track. So, um, so far I've been able to take some classes in budgeting and in, um, retirement savings and um, the program helps you with savings so I've been learning how to budget. I've been able to put $30 a week into my account since I've joined the program and the goal is to save $500 and then they match you $4,000 which seems a little ridiculous but it's a great opportunity and all together it's just a great opportunity for college students and it's going to be a blessing for my family and I. I plan to use the money for my fall tuition and books and overall, I just want more students to know about the program because it is a great help financially, especially in college when things get a little tight. So I want to thank Ms. Charmaine for helping me, and thank you. Well, fantastic, Ms. Moss. Thank you. Okay. I wish. I wish I had the foresight as a USC student uh, to be thinking about financial literacy the way that you have. And um, it's wonderful this proclamation actually not only recognizes April as uh, National Financial Literacy Month, but also recognizes Faith, Faith Moss as a model IDA participant. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Acting City Manager. Item 35, resolution number R 2018-025, authorizing condemnation for easement acquisition for CIP project SS 7261, Lake Catherine sewer yeah. line capacity enhancement. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. Clerk Colorado. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Aye. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Item 36, resolution number R2018-028, authorizing the city manager to execute any documents necessary to purchase certain properties affected by the 2015 flood through the property acquisition program. Is there an enthusiastic motion? I move I approval. Oh, move approval. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a big deal. You know, so we're, we're, we're excited um, about making the step forward uh, uh, purchasing these properties affected by the 2015 flood. Even more excited that this past uh, two weeks brought even more news that because of the advocacy of Congressman Clyburn and Senator Graham and Scott and, and others, even more resources will be flowing to the Midlands to, to uh, give relief uh, to our citizens affected in 2015 and 16. So this is exciting. Um, it's been moved and properly, properly seconded. Any discussion? I want to thank our staff and, and our, um, and our um, consultants who, who've helped uh, move this process forward, Missy, and uh, all of you, thank you so much. Um, with the previous question, Clerk Colorado. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Y'all can stand and clap now, ladies. I know y'all been waiting for <laughs> All right. So that means from now on, Mr. Paling gets all the emails, okay? Not the rest of us. Thank you all for what has been the patience of Job. I mean, as we, as we walk through these different processes and everything else, it's never easy uh, working with the federal government, but everyone's pushing in the right direction right now. So thank you all. Thank you all. All right. 
Um, Item 37, resolution number R2018-030, <clears throat> authorizing the city manager to execute an office lease agreement between the city of Columbia and MS Joint Venture. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, with the previous question, Kurt Calderell. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Item 38, resolution number R2018-031, authorizing the city manager to execute a seventh lease amendment agreement between the City of Columbia and MS Joint Venture for the lease of the 10th floor of 1401 Main. Move approval. The second. Second. Any discussion with the previous question? Uh, Mr. Mr. Rickman, please. Oh, I, I would just clarify for the public that this is where we house IT and legal in that building, and it's been there, and that's where all our infrastructure, that's why we have seven leases. It's not like we're just leasing space to lease space. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in that building. All right. Absolutely. With the previous question, Kirk Carrell. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Item 39, resolution number R2018-032, authorizing the city attorney's office to institute a civil action in the Richland County Court of Common Pleas against Dominion Carolina Gas Transmission, LLC, with South Carolina Electric and Gas, Santee Cooper Power Cooperative, and New Heights Move Church. Approval. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? We've been briefed by a legal counsel on this action. Um, we'll move the previous question. Clark Colorado. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 40 is a second reading. Um, Step out for the a mayor. Second. This is you, right? It's my neighbor. <laughs> Alan, number 40. Sure. Number 40. Uh, annexation, comprehensive plan map amendment, and zoning map amendment. 2050 Wood Creek Farms Road, tax map number 25716-0304. Is there a motion? Moved. We'll move. Okay. Second. It's been moved and properly second. If the clerk will read the roll. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Thank you. So we have to wait till seven. No, we didn't notice it for seven. We noticed it for six, right? Oh, yeah. I did, yes. Oh, you noticed it for the six. Six. Yeah, six. Oh, okay. yeah, so we can, we can rock and roll with the uh, public hearing. Um, do we reference 41 at least? No. All right. So, so, withdrawn. Yeah, so item 41, for those of you who may have been here on the drear issue, that has been withdrawn from the agenda for tonight. All right. Uh, public hearing. Uh, we're going to use this as an opportunity to open up the public hearing. Um, as many of you know, we had two public hearings today on the same um, ordinance. And anyone who wants to speak on ordinance 2018-001, uh, um, is invited to find their way to the microphone. Uh, I have um, Mr. David Harris who signed up. Um, please, the microphone is yours for three minutes. I'll be real brief because I know we've probably all heard enough about this today, but I just we want can't, to We can't figure out where you work either, by the way. <laughs> uh, I might as well do some advertising while I'm here, right? Um, I just want to say that I had the privilege a couple weeks ago of sitting down with Councilman Rickenman and Mrs. Lucas from the Neighborhood Coalition, and we discussed, you know, this, this proposal, and I disagree with some of the coalition folks that I believe this thing does have teeth. Um, the revised version has teeth. The old one had teeth as well. There was just a lot of gray areas and some confusion there. But um, I think they did a great job with this new one. I want to point that out. Um, the new version has taken a lot of that confusion out of it. Um, I believe it's fair to the businesses that are operating responsibly. And that's all we ever wanted to begin with. I think it won't be long before the businesses that are operating irresponsibly will weed themselves out I don't think that'll take long at all with these new clauses that are in this ordinance. And I think that's what we really wanted in the beginning anyway, was just to, to leave the, the ones that are doing it the right way, leave them as they've been doing for 20 plus years and, and you know, weed out the wrong ones. So uh, after that, I believe that communication would be important 
for us in these businesses and these neighborhoods. And I've always invited anyone who wants to come down to my business. I'm there all day, every day, and my door is always open if anybody wants to come and talk before it gets to this level of changing laws over, over things like this. So I just wanted to, to put my piece in that I believe this is, this is exactly what this city needs for this, for this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you a question similar to the other gentleman from Bar None? Do you serve food after in yes, the evening? We okay. serve food till five o'clock in the morning. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Uh, Mr. Sam Hoy? Or Sam Hoy. I'm assuming it's Mr. Sam Hoy. All right. There you go. Here you go, bud. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm Sam Hoy. I've worked at Bar None for just over 10 years. I've worked in Five Points for just over 11 years, um, and, uh, and honestly, I'm just confused about the whole thing. Um, Bar None's been open for 20, oh, going on 24 years. It'll be 24 years this December. Uh, they've always, we've always been a late night bar. Um, late night bars have been in existence as long as I can remember in Five Points. The only things that have changed, as far as I can tell, is the student body population, which has just ballooned in the past few years, and I think that's where we're seeing a lot of problems. If you have that many students and that, that small an area, and they're, they're living in the neighborhoods, they're passing through the neighborhoods. That's where you're gonna have an issue, whether the bars are there or not. If they're drinking in the Vista, if they're drinking on Main Street, they're still gonna be passing through those neighborhoods, they're still gonna be hitting those neighborhoods. If they're having house parties there. If we close at 2 a.m., that's probably a thing that's gonna happen. Uh, this is gonna be a problem for those neighborhoods the same as it is now, maybe even worse. Um, as far as some of the things that were spoken about earlier, uh, I remember one woman speaking about uh, paying taxes for the people who come by in the mornings and clean up trash in Five Points. As far as it's my understanding that that is paid for by the Five Points Association, that does not involve their taxes at all. That is coming. Is, that's, that's yes? That's Pardon? Public money? To get grants it's from the tax. Right. Okay. But well, so does the Vista and Main Street and everything else. So that's so not a, that's not here. Not <laughs> it's it's public public money. Money. I, I may be incorrect about that. Uh, but a good point that it, that's not the only place that trash gets picked up by yeah. people who are paid with public dollars. So. As far as something else that was discussed earlier where um, I believe there was one woman who was speaking about how easy it was for Charleston and Greenville to, uh, to transition to 2 a.m. and how businesses like Husk stay in business. Husk is not a bar and Charleston has a completely different culture from Columbia. Uh, that's a top tourist destination that is a very big food city and, and um, there's some great restaurants in town, but, but it's not the same thing at all. And I, and I think, you know, closing bars at 2 a.m., you're going to hurt my bottom line. You're going to hurt a lot of bars' bar bottom lines. You're going to see a lot of places close. You'll be hurt very badly by this. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm still confused as to why this is suddenly an issue when it hasn't been for 24 years. Uh, that's, that's all I have to say about it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hoy. Ms. Kara Cato. Did you know? Hey, Carol. How are you? Hey, Mayor Benjamin, how are you, members of council? I certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak before you, even though I know it's probably uh, not going to make a big difference, but um, I appreciate the opportunity anyway. Um, it's kind of hard to fight alcohol, and a lot of people fight it every day. You know, uh, they're under medical care, most of them, um, or a lot more probably need to be. But I'm here as really speaking for, uh, to the organization, our Wales Garden organization, I'm vice president. Uh, of it, and the president could not be uh, present tonight and asked me to speak. Uh, but we have a lovely neighborhood, and I think that Columbia can point to our community with great pride. Uh, our uh, owner occupied uh, home ownership is way up, and it's growing. We have an opportunity to really do something in this community, but I will tell you that. Uh, there are things that happen in our community that frankly frighten me. 
I've lived there for 15 years. I've lived in the same house for 15 years. I put a lot of money into that house. And uh, I plan to age in place there. I am elderly. So <laughs> take that into consideration before you count me out. So um, I am elderly. I am a citizen. I pay taxes. And uh, there are many other uh, women that live in that community. We are single women, we are alone. Uh, but we feel, we have always uh, tried to feel uh, safe in the community. There have been several times, now this is just my, just what happened in my little space, okay? There were two things that happened. Uh, I, as I say, I've lived there for 15 years. These two things really stand out and almost caused me to move my residency uh, from, that, from that area. Uh, one, um, 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, a young lady, she was an honor student, of all things, from uh, USC, and she was highly intoxicated. She came barreling down from Pickens Street onto Ennery Avenue, and she struck the SUV of my neighbor across the street, totaled her automobile. Now, all of this is, it, the, should be in the police department. I mean, you just don't have to take my word for it. Um, anyway, um, you can imagine the sound that that made. And here am I, uh, an elderly person in my bed, thinking I am safe. I'm telling you, the way the cars go up and down there, there is no room to be safe. It's not, it's not safe to walk on the sidewalks in the broad daylight. People drink during the day, too. So if they can drink all night, I guess that'll fill it up. But anyway, uh, I would like to say the other thing was, uh, this happened about three years ago, Four young men came up on my porch one morning. It was before I was awakened, before I was out of bed. My neighbors saw them and called the police. Uh, they were highly intoxicated and they had to be taken away by the police. You know, we don't need to have a neighborhood like this. We don't need to have our citizens violated like this. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Gunner. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Um, Ms. Lynn Bailey. Good evening. Uh, I am Lynn Bailey, and I'm a 30-year resident of Rosewood. But before I moved to Rosewood, I lived for 10 years on Lawrence Street around the University of South Carolina. I am also a professional healthcare economist and my office is on Divine Street, right up from Dave's fine establishment. So I've lived in Columbia since 1974, and I'm here to ask the City Council to support the recommendation of the hard work of the Public Safety Committee's proposed modification to the 2 a.m. bar closing that will continue to permit the bars to remain open after 2 a.m. I believe the repeal of the closing hour would only punish business owners that are behaving. As a professional economist educated at USC, I believe the enrollment growth and changes in alcohol consumption habits by students is what is driving the problem. In 1975, there were just less than 23,000 students at the USC campus. In 2000, there were approximately 24,000 students. By 2010, there was just 25,000 students. Today, there are slightly less than 30,000 students. And that is an increase of 139%. And this is the driver of the five points issue. What I do know is that over 40 years, 
USC neighborhoods have had problems with five points. Growth in UNC enrollment in the next 10 years will add approximately 10,000 more students. Um, so USC has been, had both positive and negative effects on Columbia, especially the Five Points community. We have had benefits, but we've also had cost. Unless City Council and Mayor Benjamin are planning to persuade President Pastides and the USC board to limit total USC growth enrollment in these, these issues will continue. USC expansions will continue. There needs to be reasonable modifications and adjustments by all the parties, USC leadership, students, residents, five points, merchants, and area visitors. Modifying the current ordinance is part of that community activity. Having USC improve its alcohol prevention and treatment activities is another as it better and more frequent enforcement of city by inspectors sled for alcohol enforcement. This has to be a total community effort. It is amazing how many students have drinking problems at USC and there is very little that the USC community talks about doing. But I do want to thank the public, serve, the public Safety Committee for its thoughtful evaluation of all issues and carefully listening to all sides of the issue. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. All right. Um, have no one else who signed up to speak at the public hearing? All right. All right. Um, did you? Oh. Okay. Oh, please. If y'all, if y'all wouldn't mind, um, if you do tend to speak, of course, come one at a time. But make sure you sign the little sheet so we have a public record. I'm sorry. I'm just introduce yourself. It's all right. Uh, it's all right. It's come every week if you like. <laughs> we, we won't be here every week, but if you want to come, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to learn. You know, it's effort. Uh, I just want to say my name is Robert Brady, and uh, I'm trying to kind of speak in mediation, being an outside point of view on the whole issue. Um, I can see both the benefit from bars closing at 2 a.m. and it also not closing at 2 a.m. There's a lot of people that, you know, maybe work two jobs, sometimes even three jobs that, you know, when they get off at 8, the only other bar that they can go to for another shift is somewhere that's open until about 5 in the morning. I had a close friend of mine work that 5 a.m. shift for three years before he got a better job, and it's just what he could do at the time. Um, from what I've heard from people tonight, it seems to be not so much an issue with the bar themselves, but the patrons that are going there and causing all this disturbance in neighborhoods, loud noises, drinking after hours. And uh, I just feel like something need to be thought about is the 2 a.m. rule being those patrons are doing this now. I feel like at the end of the night, they're just gonna rush to drink more at 2 a.m. It's not gonna solve the issues. It's gonna see how many shots I can get down before that clock hits. And uh, going on with that, continuing on that it's USC is growing. I think a better option that I kind of thought of myself would be, I don't know, again, very new at this, I don't know how you would go about doing it, but a lot of colleges across the country do not allow freshmen to bring cars to campus. Limiting freshmen at USC bringing cars to campus might help at least for them being able to get down to five points and back and causing so much of a disruption. Might also help with the hazing issues at USC that me speaking of multiple friends. I've grown up in Columbia my whole life. I had multiple people go through USC. Hazing's a real issue. You know, whether they fraternity life wants to talk about it or not. Cutting out cars for the freshman year would add parking spots all around town for the upperclassmen. Might, control, might curb at least a little bit of this growth in five points along with give students a year to adjust to that freedom, you know, where a lot of them might be making those types of decisions. I just want to thank council for hearing me out. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. If you wouldn't mind signing that um, sheet. Right who has it? Shanique, who has the sheet? Oh, right behind you. Just so we have a record. And thank you for participating. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. 
Uh, good, good evening. My name is Casey Hamlin. I'm the chair of the Student Government Safety and Transportation Committee. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the student government officially. I just kind of wanted to give a more of a student perspective to all of this. Um, and I'm glad to hear all the dialogue that's been happening. Um, I want to say that I do believe that a majority of students, as has kind of been said tonight, do, pr do agree with keeping bars open past two. Um, you can find out whatever reason you want that they might do that and just kind of bringing that to the table. Um, but I do want the communities and the city of Columbia and all that to know that students do realize we do have a responsibility. We realize that we need to know what our limit is before we go back, try to go back to campus. We do realize that we need to look out for each other and make, keep our friends safe while we're down in five points. There are a lot of bad apples, as some members of the communities have been saying, that you know don't follow those rules. And I want to promise you that we're trying to figure out why that happens and how we can mitigate that, because it is a problem for our communities and for the city of Columbia as a whole. But we also cannot ignore the responsibilities that bar owners do have. Um, it's making sure that students who are underage aren't entering bars. I know there's been a lot of conversation about how good fake IDs are getting, but there are ways to get around that. Uh, it's making sure we're not over-serving students who clearly should not have any more and then just kicking them out of your bar and saying, I hope you find your way home. Uh, it is about ensuring the security of their establishments. And I think these are all things that this ordinance does very well, as long as it's enforced by the city and the appropriate agencies. If there's no enforcement there, we're just going to keep seeing fights break out. We're just going to keep seeing high hospitalization rates. I come from the class that had the over 200% increase in hospitalization rates, so I understand that that's a real prevalent issue. Um, and then just general violence that happens in the area. But I do want you all to know that there are student leaders who are working on this, who are trying to mitigate the issues that do exist, because we realize we do have a responsibility as students, as members of the USC, Carolina, and Columbia communities to do so. Um, we hope to keep working with y'all and the appropriate officials as time goes on to keep making sure that we keep making positive progress. Uh, and we just, if you ever need any of our input or anything, please reach out to us because we love to hear from you and we hope y'all love to hear from us. So thank you. No, thank Mr. you Mayor. for being here. It, uh, Mr. Duval, please. Is it Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Hamlin, uh, you say the majority of the USC students would uh, not support closing the bars at 2 a.m.? That would be my belief, at least students who attend these establishments. That would be my belief. There's no formal statistics What do you there. think the average age of a student at USC is? The average age? Well, I mean, if you looked at going about 18, staying until about 22, 23, so it's going to be a, about the drinking age, a little lower, probably. You, you don't think you're anywhere close to 21? I believe it's close to 21, but it could very well be below 21. It could be above 21. Um, I mean, either way, students are going to bars heavily. I mean, either, a lot of under 21s do end up in these bars. So it's, I mean, you could say that, yes, just because they're under 21, that they will support it, but it doesn't matter because they are under 21 and they shouldn't be there in the first place. But I'm, that's just, I mean, the reality of the situation. So the underage drinkers from USC are part of the problem. I mean, you could theoretically say that, yes. I think he started off talking about student responsibility. I think I did, uh, and yeah. if I can, sorry, Mayor Benjamin, oh, if please, I can just so. kind of come in on that. Yep. You know, we do go through, as freshmen, where we are, it's mandatory for us to take what's called alcohol EDU. It's an online program that does teach us about the dangers mm -hmm. of alcohol. The University 101, which is the premier transitional program for freshmen in the country, I believe almost every other school models after us. Um, we go through that, and it's a lesson that we take. Um, at the end of the day, students will, there will be underage students who will drink and be irresponsible. It's going to happen, but I do believe that there are the vast majority of students who understand the responsibility um, that comes with making decisions like that. Sometimes it doesn't always manifest itself, and I think we spend so much time looking at seeing all the negative stories in the news and hearing all the negative stories that we don't hear, you know, students who are responsible because that's not going to make the front page of the newspaper. That's not going to make it online anywhere. That's just, no one's going to care about that or hear about that. So all we hear is the negative. Um, and I do believe that that's a vast minority of students who engage in that kind of destructive, violent, and just negative behavior overall. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, uh, thank for, you for participating. For being here. Thank you. And let's also just recognize that although you may not be 21 years old, you still have a voice here. You're still a citizen. You can still vote, and you still have an opinion on on, on issues of, of public policy. And just about five miles that way, you can actually carry an M16 and go to Afghanistan and Syria and everywhere else and fight for this country. So that's a whole other story. Come on up. Ma'am. Mayor Benjamin, uh, your city council. Uh, my name is Katerina Berry. This is the fourth meeting that I'm attending and the fourth time that I'm speaking. The first time was in front of the city council. Back in January, I've attended two public safety committees. I'm 24 years old. I'm a resident of Columbia, South Carolina. I'm a small business owner, and I run a marketing company that works with small local businesses. So I'm, I consider myself to be very involved in a part of this community at, to the extent that I can participate. My biggest concern with uh, eliminating the extended hours for bars, personally, is that um, as, as an entrepreneur and as a person who doesn't work standard hours, I often work at nights. And uh, the late night bars, um, especially uh, Bar None, has been a safe space, an absolutely perfectly safe space, where uh, the staff um, takes care of the safety, where I'm able to get a very late night dinner, um, have a table, have uh, usage of Wi-Fi, and be able to continue my work. Um, I am afraid, I'm very concerned that should the late night hours be eliminated, we will be limiting significantly the growth of this community and we will be deterring young professionals that are moving into this area that like the freedom, like the freedom to live their life however they choose, and like the freedom to be able to go out late at night without people telling them when to go to sleep. So in the, uh, in the interest of this community, in the interest of its future, in the interest of its growth, we want to attract young talent. And according to statistics, and, and I don't have the exact quote, but this is uh, something that is um, a very well-known fact and is in fact quoted by multiple media sources. By the year 2020, 20% 20 of the United States population will be self-employed. And there's a major shift towards that in general in the nation. So I am very afraid that by limiting these freedoms of people who live here, we will be also limiting the influx of entrepreneurs which help our community thrive. And that's, that's just all. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Make sure you sign up too, okay? Anyone else here to speak at the public hearing? <laughs> Didn't you speak earlier? <laughs> did, you, did you forget something? I did. Okay. <laughs> just a short quote. I, I would appreciate just a, a moment of your time. Uh, I, I spoke earlier about being in support of the, the ordinance in front of us uh, for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons that I'm in, in support of it is because I believe, uh, contrary to maybe popular belief on this side of the room, that uh, the bars being open for an extended period of time actually keeps students who especially are of drinking age, but in general also, keeps them safer. And here's uh, just a quote that I wanted to read from the Richland County uh, Coroner, Gary Watts from 2015. At that time, a USC student had died of alcohol poisoning at a house party. He was interviewed by the state and he said, it's something I think we see too often. Everybody's drinking and having a good time and somebody says, oh man, my friend passed out. We'll let him sleep it off. They're not going to sleep it off. They're going to die. Some type of medical intervention needs to take place in a lot of these cases and it doesn't. We've established that college students are going to drink. They can drink in unsafe situations where they might die, or they can sit, drink at a bar where you have employees who are bound both by their moral integrity but also by the law to not let that happen. And that's, that's one of the biggest reasons that I believe that this ordinance is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else here to speak at the public hearing? on? Ordinance number 2018-001. All right, seeing none. Um, Mr. Oh, well, actually, is there a motion? There is. I, I would move that we move it forward for first reading with the understanding that we will be working with folks, um, especially Ms. Lucas, who has uh, been delightful to work with, um, on making sure that we can 
maybe see if there's some tweaking that, that can go along that, that may give them some more comfort. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk. I've had several people in here say that this ordinance has no teeth, and I just don't think that they actually read it because I don't think they wanted to read it. I think we have a good ordinance that gives our police department the ability to enforce, but also gives us an opportunity for, for the world that is beyond the nine to fivers to have their world, the hospitality operation, and don't affect people's lives. David Harris and Rachel Harris, Marty and, and Barbara Driesen, people who I know personally who have been in the business for 20 something years and you know support their family. They do the right thing. And I think we should support those families who do the right thing. A clear blanket and repeal of an ordinance that affects people's lives is not how we operate. And that's not what the intent was. I think there's a great opportunity for, for us to move forward. And I'd like to move this motion forward and that between second reading, we uh, work together. Second. Second. Moved and probably seconded. We're in uh, period discussion. Uh, discussion. Uh, uh, all right. All right. So um, we're going to um, move the previous question. Clark Colorado. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Um, I do. I do want to say this. Um, uh, we are going to have. Uh, aye. I'm not sure if I voted. Uh, I appreciate the leadership of, of all members of council, even with various differing opinions. I uh, thank all the neighborhood leaders on, on, on all sides of this, and particularly um, April Lucas um, and um, Mr. Gottschall and, and uh, Ms. Smith and, and everyone else. You know, the, uh, there's some uh, significant uh, issues that have been raised over the last uh, day alone, but over the last several weeks. And we are dealing with some significant growth in the USC student body. We're dealing with uh, significant issues of, 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 of mental health and, 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 and dependency we have to uh, deal with. Uh, people are, are, are seeing some major challenges of just enjoying their homes in, in, in peace and, and, and quiet. And we all have mutual responsibilities to try and make that a reality. There are bar owners in, in Five Points. It's the university. It's a city and, and all of its uh, folks that are here. And it's, it's, and it's our neighbors working together. And obviously, as uh, as young man mentioned, the students and the personal responsibility uh, piece here is also very, very important. And I think in, in order for us to get somewhere, we're going to have to spend some time working on a more, much more perfect solution as opposed to pointing the fingers at, at, at each other. We can make some things happen. It's going to require a lot more dialogue, and, and hopefully we'll have some productive discussions um, that, that may lead to some amendments between now and the, um, uh, in the second reading of, of this ordinance. I do believe this, though, having read the ordinance again and again and the hard work of, of our, our colleagues here, I don't believe that a business whose business model is feeding alcohol to underage drinkers and packing them into the restaurants is going to be able to survive under this new ordinance and ought not survive under this new ordinance. I do believe that this will represent a, a culling of sorts a, 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 of, of some who may, who I believe in, who I do believe are also in the distinct minority uh, of businesses uh, in, in, in five points and across the city. Uh, I believe that some will not survive, uh, but that others who are, who are not only providing the service but also contributing significantly to the vibrancy of the city will hopefully continue to grow and, 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 and prosper. We can get there, y'all. Uh, the process of democracy is never fun. It's never easy. Um, but, but we seem to figure things out. What requires us working together and not, 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 not doing this nonstop. We can make it happen. Uh, Mr. Rickman? I just, I, I think one thing uh, I do think we ought to add to the conversation is that this doesn't limit us in trying to fix some of the other issues that are outside of of extended permits and yeah. so I don't want people to think that the discussion stops after this it doesn't we've just begun yeah. so absolutely yeah. um, mr. McDonald and I, and I, excuse me I gotta say this this is not a win-win situation it's not I think you've charged us with the responsibility to do the fiduciary thing and that's to do to put together a document that not only has teeth, but has the ability to strengthen places 
where there is something positive going on. Now, some will say, and I just got a letter from Dr. Edwards, and I think each of you may have gotten that letter also as it relates to uh, Carolina's responsibility. You didn't get, it's in the box okay. now. Yeah, I hadn't read it yet. Um, which I think is admirable because there's some responsibility there. I think we've got an opportunity, folk. We got an opportunity to stop playing them and they, or they and them. And if we're going to make this place a bigger place and a better place, it's going to take more than just whispering and talking at each other. There has to be legitimate conversation, dialogue about how we are going to make this city continue to grow. Yes. We've got our issues, but when we look at our issues here and issues across the river, I'm sorry, I better not say that. Across the river, uh, it is substantially great here as, it oppo as, it, as opposed to anywhere else. So I would just simply admonish each of you, perhaps there is a di dialogue in time, a conversating time, where we can talk to make this thing real, not only for uh, persons who are involved passionately, but for our city. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Councilman McDowell. All right, let's keep it moving. Uh, item 43. Item 43, <clears throat> ordinance number 2018-003, granting encroachment to CD Park 7, Columbia SC High Rise. Is there a second? second. Moving second, discussion. Move the previous question, Clerk Colorado. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Item 44 is ordinance number 2018-012, 12th Supplemental Waterworks and Sewer Move System Revenue chair. Bonds, providing yeah. for the issuance. Move. Uh, motion, motion. Is there a second? Second. Move and second. Discussion? Is that, is, all right. Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. Uh, call the roll. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 45, ordinance number 2018-013, authorized and providing for the issuance of storm water system revenue bonds of the City of Columbia, South Carolina, prescribing the form of bonds, limiting the payment of the bonds solely to the revenues derived from the operation. Yeah, motion. So move. Is there a second? Okay. Discussion? Um, I know we'll we have some discussion probably on 46. Uh, with the previous question, Clark Colorado. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. <clears throat> Item 46, ordinance number 2018-014, a first supplemental ordinance providing for the issuance and sale of City of Columbia, South Carolina stormwater system revenue bonds in one or more series in the aggregate principal amount of not exceeding $50 million dollars in order to finance various capital projects and improvements to the system, any necessary debt service reserves and issuance costs. motion. Cost. So move. Is there a second? Second. Um, uh, a discussion. You, I'm excited about this. I know that uh, we're all very excited about this. Um, did you want to say something, uh, Clint? Uh, I, I was I just hoping maybe Clint could just, I mean, yeah, it, it's it something that we've been working on and a lot of people been waiting for and, and you know, uh, everybody's invested in it. So I just thought it'd be well worth for, for Clint to spend a few Over the minutes. course of the program, what, tw top 20 projects that we identified? How many? Yes, top, top 20 flooding challenges in the city are being addressed by our, our first um, storm of the bonds. Yes, sir. I guess probably in the history of the city. And this, um, this is, is really a... a very monumental moment for us to be able to fund some of these projects. We already have three projects underway, MLK Park, um, Water Quality Improvement Project, Wallace Street, and Harlem Heights will be starting very soon. And um, we're also, this is going to allow funding for us to design and construct improvements in the Shannon area, Randall Avenue, Penn Branch, Whaley and Main, Five Points, Gills Creek, looking at conveyance and green infrastructure. So it's really uh, implementing your initiative that you charged us with this past year and providing the funding to do that. So we're really excited and are grateful for the, for the opportunity. Awesome, awesome, Good. awesome. I move the previous question, or call the roll. All right, Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. 
Item 47, Council is asked to approve the installation of one additional street light on Florence Street and two additional street lights on Preston Street as requested by the Traffic Engineering motion. Division. Motion. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Move the previous question. I'm Clark Colorado. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 48. 48, Council is asked to approve the installation of three speed humps in the Oakwood Court neighborhood as requested by the Public Works Department. Before the young people leave, where are you guys from? You guys students? Where you guys, where, where you guys? I had to call, I had to call you, I had to call you. No, no, you, got, you, can, you can still leave, it's okay. We don't take it personally. I just want to know, are you guys USC students or what? Where are you guys from? Wait, what school? Are you students or USC, where? Are you journalism students or just J school students, okay? That was really enthusiastic. Okay, all right. <laughs> so to make sure. Those two might be runaways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Good deal. Well, glad to have you here. Hope you got to see some uh, some policy making going on, some sausage making. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, neighborhood association leadership, good to go with the speed bumps. Yes. All right. With the previous question, Clerk Calderell. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Can I ask a question while we're on yeah, speed? We, have, we do have one uh, citizen who's asked to speak as well. Uh huh. It, how are we now that uh, Robert? Now that we have a change in DOT commissioners and so forth, how are we handling roads in our neighborhoods that are DOT that have requests for speed humps? We'll have to go to breakfast with the old commissioner. <laughs> I guess so. Eggs up at 9 o'clock. On Thursday. <laughs> the DOT itself is actually taking a look at their policy and looking at rewriting it or making some modifications to it. So hopefully it will help us in the end. You think I do not think on some of the higher uh, traveled roads that we will ever get speed humps. No, but, you know, I do think that we need to revisit certain areas. And I don't know if bump outs or other options are there, but... Um, I do think we have some issues, but we've got since since we've changed the speed limit in certain places, we're pushing traffic in other places, and um, so I'm getting oh, more and more requests. Robert, let me ask you, can I ask you a question. There are always, there has been some letters from communities, of course, for identifying places in 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 my, say in my district that has requested street bumps. Will that policy be a He's part? Talking about humps, not bumps. He's talking about bumps. That's something totally different. Don't you know the difference? Let me finish. Don't interrupt <laughs> me, man. You trying to get over a hump, and I'm looking for a bump. All right. <laughs> let me let me finish. Whether it's called a hump or a bump, when you go over it, you know you've gone over it. When that. <laughs> When that letter is introduced, when they've written that letter from the community, what's the process after that? So what we do is when we get interest, we go out and do a speed study on the street. And then we try, if the speeds meet, or if they don't meet, we try to locate where the speed humps would go with the understanding that there will be signs in the yard before and after the speed humps. So then we take that back to the neighborhood for them to approve before we bring it to council. Once council's approved, we have to take it to SCDOT if it's on a DOT road for them to approve. So we've just recently started putting in two or three additional ones in Golden Acres, I believe. Okay. Golden Acres and Standish. Good story on PowerPoints, okay? Great story. All right. Um, let, me, let me add to this. Um, in fact, I was just in the neighborhood last night and came out with, there's going to be a request for several entire neighborhood has some speeding issues. Um, if you recall, we did have at least one sit down with DOT staff, our staff. My position is, and I think it would work in every neighborhood, the reason for the speed humps, as opposed to, I think, the state's traditional way of, of dealing with them and approving them. It's a safety issue. I think we have to insist on doing whatever it takes to make a, help make a neighborhood safe. Because you have neighborhoods where um, people don't walk, just don't walk the neighborhood, say this time of day, because traffic 
especially when there's no sidewalks. And if, so if we can't get sidewalks in neighborhoods, we ought to work cooperatively to try and get go with some other means of um, calming the traffic. And speed bumps are a, a traffic calming humps. They are humps, by the way. Speed, speed humps are, are one way of um, calming the traffic, the same as you know, adding stop signs, four-way stops, three-way stops, bump outs, or whatever else. So, um, but the bottom line, though, is from my perspective, when we come for the, for the request, it's a legitimate request that comes from neighborhoods. And I think we, we owe it to them to uh, do what we can to make that a reality for them. Because we know that everybody doesn't want them, but they're necessary in some cases. I would, I would like to know where, yeah, I'd like to know where they are because we do try to follow up with all neighborhoods. And Councilman Rickerman, I, I do want to say that you think? through Dana and myself, we are actually starting a collaboration meeting with SCDOT, I believe on the 23rd for city staff. We'll definitely make sure this is on the agenda. While you're here, Robert, can we talk about three-way stops? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear about speed humps or bumps or dumps or any more for the next six months. All right. Um, can I ask Robert a question, though? I do, I do have a question. Just so this summer we'll be coming up on three years of the recycle roll carts. And I'm just noticing, I know I'm waiting every two weeks. It fills up very quickly. What are y'all are seeing? And are, is there any discussions about doing recycling every week versus every other week. <laughs> we do get that request quite often. I think if the council desires that, what we would do is go back and put a cost together of what it would cost us to put the trucks on the road the additional times for per year, where we actually take those trucks off the road now. So there could be some additional personnel costs and maintenance costs. I also think that it's worth us sometime having a conversation about the recycling markets right now and what's going on. Make a motion. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson? Be texted to him tonight. Okay. No, I, I, I would just make a motion that we refer that to the That's Environment right. Infrastructure you, you? Committee. That's you, right? You're yeah, here, right? but it's going right. to officially be referred. Let, let's and we'll run talk some about numbers. That. Run some numbers on going to every week versus two weeks. Two weeks. Is, is that a motion? Yes. Is that a second? Second. Any discussion? With the previous question, clerk, call the roll. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. The propriety and efficiency of going to weekly recycling. Um, so I have to figure out which day to take my roll card out. We have a citizen, Ms. Malaysia Haley. Is that, did I say your last name right? Is it Haley? Haley. Haley. I, I, I thought so, but I gave it a shot. Greetings. Uh, greetings. I'm Mayor Benjamin and the people of the council and everyone else. My name is Malaysia Halley, and I am the creator of Heal With Me, an organization that is dedicated to stopping child abuse, um, child sexual abuse. And I work with organizations and individuals who want to stop child abuse in their um, communities. And for April 21st, um, which is also, other than the other um, awareness events that's going on this month, is also child abuse awareness. And we are having an event called um, the Healing, Healing and Empowerment Day of Columbia. And on April 21st at the South Carolina State House, we're gonna have an empowerment rally for survivors of child abuse. And we wanted to invite the community out. And from two to four later on that day, we're gonna be, um, hey McDowell, I know you're ready for me to say hey. <laughs> we're gonna be um, doing some yoga and meditation to teach the community how to heal through yoga and meditation. So. I want to see if I can pass these out to you. Absolutely, please. Pass it, pass it on out. Do some tweeting about it, too. Thank you, Ms. Halley. All right, no other citizens have signed up to speak. Are we, are we good? Good. Um, I want all the journalism students to stay behind another hour or so. We got some stuff we got to cover. <laughs> we, need, we need your advice and counsel on a number of different speed humps and five points and, and everything else. So uh, don't rush off too fast. <laughs> too fast. Um, any other
committee reports or referrals to committee? Seeing none, can we have a non-debatable motion to adjourn? A second. Second. Any discussion? Move the previous question. Court call roll. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Have a good evening.